from USA 2020. Today is our second day of, and the concluding day of broadcast for this year's event. For those that managed to join us yesterday, um, I hope you found the discussions of value and welcome back. And those that missed the, yesterday's discussions, don't worry, we've got um, all the sessions being uploaded or uploaded already on the on-demand page, as we will be doing with today's session. So um, plenty of time for you to access them today, and then they'll be there live all of next week. So do, do dive in, do see the discussions that are shared both today and yesterday. For today, we've got a number of great sessions ahead of us, uh, including addressing the ongoing plastic dilemma with closed loop partners, HP and US Plastics Pact, empowering suppliers to, to help deliver a net zero business in partnership with Amphesis, uh, closing loop on net zero, the case for circularity. But first up, as you can see on your screens now, we have the opening keynote for today's discussion. It's my pleasure to introduce the, the session titled Embedding Risk and Resilience in Your Net Zero Strategy. And it's in partnership with Guidehouse. And it's a very timely discussion, I'm sure you'll all agree. Leading the discussion, we have Britt Harter, Sustainability S Solutions Lead at Guidehouse. Gary Jeddo, CSO at LA County. Paula Dipana, uh, Policy Advisor at CDP. Hella Bank Jorgensen, CEO and founder of Competent Boards. Before I hand over to Hella to chair the discussion, I uh, want to remind those that joined us yesterday and those that are joining today, it's live. Uh, they're here to answer your questions. So do use the Q&A box just to the side of this live stream. So yeah, get the questions in and we'll try and get through as many as we can. But for now, it's my pleasure to hand over to Hella. Well, thank you so much, Liam, and good morning, everyone. I hope that you enjoyed the sessions yesterday. I have the honor of opening today's session and perhaps I would say the most important questions for companies, countries and counties at the moment. So what does a net zero strategy look like? How will it impact our business financial results? How will it impact the county of Los Angeles? We'll hear a little bit about that. How do we embed risk and resiliency into our strategy to be prepared perhaps not only for climate change, but also impact uh, on future pandemics, political, cultural, demographic crisis. I'm talking to many companies and, and board of directors about this, and I, I am hoping to learn, and I'm hoping to get some very concrete tips, and I asked the speakers to give us that, concrete tips and perhaps a to-do list of action points um, today. So um, without further ado, again, welcome to, to the three of you. But Paula, maybe I would start with you. And could you please give us an overview um, are, and how are companies creating net zero strategies uh, with a success to, to agility to adapt to future risk or scenarios? If you could give us the, the overview as, as a start. Sure. I mean, uh... You know, it's the best of times and the worst of times. Thank you for, uh, for uh, uh, inviting me to this and thank you all for being here. So, you know, CDP is a disclosure platform and we're not a crystal ball, but among the things that I've noticed that we're, we're kind of in a, in, a, in a time of anxiety plus opportunity. And so I thought I would just start out with a basic observation about net zero and then some key data points. I mean, I think the thing to keep in mind about net zero is for the moment, these these uh, these uh, t targets are set for dates beyond 30, 2030, some as far out as 2050. And so there is a question as to who's going to be responsible for delivering on those, because those are well beyond today's uh, decision maker uh, arc of, of authority. So what can we look at? And I thought I would just share with you some uh, key data points from the CDP disclosure, because disclosure is a sort of rec reflection of the degree to which companies are moving forward. So, you know, just, uh, just a key observation, science-based targets, which you probably all have heard of, which we track as a big initiative. I mean, that the growth in that, which means that companies are taking climate science on board has been exponential from about 200 companies setting science-based targets, which by the way are verified, uh, about 220 in 2017 to almost a thousand today. And that's obviously huge growth. And yesterday we announced that this science-based target initiative is now going to apply to the financial sector so that they will have to apply science-based targets to their portfolio holdings, which is very important. Um, generally speaking, disclosure to CDP climate change has also grown this year to about 2,500 companies, uh, about, which is about 56% of market cap. And that has been 100 new companies just this year. 
as a result of investor pressure in our non-disclosure campaign. So, um, and that includes a couple of major emitters in the cement industry, which as everybody knows is very difficult to reduce emissions. Um, and we've had growth in all of our programs for, in forest and water, all those numbers are going up. On the other hand, on the anxiety side <clears throat> and the role of regulation, which I think is very critical, we did a report last year or late this year um, on opportunities and risks. And interestingly in the United States, um, companies that were headquartered in the United States as compared to Europe reported $850 billion less in opportunities than, their, than companies based in the EU. Now that means the downside of addressing climate change, the upside rather of addressing climate change may not be as perceived and agreed and understood by companies based in the US and that can only derive from an absence of regulatory certainty. Because at least in the EU, there's a policy framework that guides capital flow and people can predict, we're gonna have that, this tax incentive for 10 years or this incentive for 10 years. Here in the US, it's fits and starts and there's nothing coherent at all. So if you're trying to uh, invest your uh, company for the future, it's very difficult to know what the regulatory minimum is going to be. So I think that's something that needs to be um, taken into consideration relative to net zero targeting in the US. It would be very hard to set coherent net zero targets and meet them if there isn't a coherent policy framework that settles that in. Now you juxtapose all of that on the growth in environmental investment and the whole drive to purpose led businesses. Interesting stat is that uh, today one in four dollars in the United States is invested is screened in one way or another for ESG. Now this of course re reflects on boards, uh, you know, board concerns as well. Um, but but that's, that is um, way up from one in nine in 2012. And this is the sustainable investment forum data. So that means a lot of people are screening capital for ESG considerations. So how do we go from say all this data to a bigger, a bigger uh, bang. I mean, to, for me, the two key things are the TCFD. You know, obviously the growth in disclosure would indicate that companies are concerned about alignment with the task force on climate related disclosure. CDP is aligned with that. We're the only pathway you can actually use now to follow those recommendations. So that the growth in disclosure would indicate to me a, a, a reflection that companies are taking TCFD recommendations seriously. And secondly, we do have this outstanding question of the price on carbon, which is central to driving all change. And we, had, we don't have a coherent carbon market. On the other hand, there is now some attempt to internationalize existing markets, develop further the voluntary carbon markets. So I would keep an eye on carbon pricing as the ultimate driver in all of this. So that's a kind of a big picture, small picture, and I'll leave it to you to go forward. Thank you. Thanks so much, Paula. So a takeaway is that TCFD is definitely one and, and, and as you're saying, the root also with the CDP. So Britt, if I may go to you, um, you work with many companies, I understand. And so do, do everyone understand? Do everyone actually have the language when we say net zero uh, and what a transition plan look like? And, and perhaps if you can build into that, what Paula was saying in terms of like, you know, 2050, that's, that's, that's a few years out in the future. You know, is that good enough or do we need some more concrete plans? Mm -hmm, absolutely. And first off, thank you all for having me here. Paula, thank you for coming. Gary, thank you for coming. Both sustainability luminaries with decades of experience. And it's a real pleasure for, for me and for Guidehouse to be here with you. So in terms of what that means from, you know, from figuring out how to actually operationalize this. Yes, we work with companies across the spectrum. We work with governments. We work with multilaterals on the biggest stages, figuring out how to embed sustainability, how to change the organizations to, in the ways that they need to meet these megatrend challenges like climate change, and how to make those concepts digestible, engageable for organizations, especially companies, but also governments. And so really what we're seeing with all these, as you say, with all these terms, we've got net zero, we've got science-based, we've got climate neutral, carbon neutral, risk, resilience, climate risk, uh, TCFD, is a lot going on. But when it all comes back to this, we're really talking about two ideas. And it's the two classic climate policy ideas. We're talking about mitigation and adaptation. 
mitigation, putting fewer greenhouse gas causing emissions into the atmosphere, adaptation, preparing to live and hopefully thrive in a world that we know is changing and is going to be changing more dramatically due to climate change. And so what we're seeing from a, from a company perspective, you know, mitigation, much like, uh, much like in the policy debate, mitigation is more mature than adaptation. We know how to account for greenhouse gases. We know how to set bold targets about them. We know, and we really are seeing more and more companies, as Paul said, setting bold science-based targets that, that represent their share of, of what needs to be reduced. Whether they're too long, many of them, you know, many of them are a little bit long, but we're, we're moving step by step to get bolder and bolder. We know how to reduce those emissions. We actually, and we've gotten good ROI as, uh, as technologies have gotten more mature on a lot of those reductions. There's still a lot left to do. And, and this is something we're helping companies with is some of them really just need to understand the footprint and set the goal. Others of them are way out tackling some of those really tricky issues, like how do we influence the finance markets? How do we influence our supply chain and our scope three emissions? And these are all things that, you know, how do we deliver technologies maybe that are a, a more challenging to finance or we're capital constrained? And those are all things we're working closely with them on in terms of, you know, creating the, the disclosure standards and the science-based targets for the finance industry, working with the, the PCAF, the Partnership for Carbon Accounting Financials, to set methods for how to measure financed emissions, convening supply chains and showing that the power of procurement, whether you are the brand that can leverage your procurement or whether you're one who is a supplier and figuring out how to make those partnerships both pre-competitive and advantageous. We do a lot of convening and figuring out where you should partner together, where you should go it alone in order to drive those emissions down and keep moving moving towards those science-based targets and those reductions. Then the flip side of this that we talked about, so we've talked about mitigation. Now the cha real challenge is risk, resilience, adaptation. We're in a pandemic. Um, our, our lives are disrupted. We, we're having massive fires. All of the sort of things we've talked about about climate change are starting to, starting to feel, and we're starting to feel them as organizations. And this debate is much less mature straight out, you know, we're, we're all being caught, frankly, a little bit flat-footed, and organizations are moving faster, and some of them are doing better and better, and TCFD, the, um, and TCFD disclosure, I think, is a really key first step. It's a great framework. It helps companies in a, engage in a structured way around some of these topics and disclose and show their seriousness and start to think about them. But I think if we said to anybody, oh, you've done a TCFD report. Okay, we're done. You're climate resilient. Um, I think we can all you know, call it a day. But, you know, I think we all know from, from some of the response, responses I'm seeing from the other panelists, we're not quite there yet. And you know, one of the other things we're seeing is we're getting really, you know, the climate model data is getting a lot better. You're getting you're starting to see more sophisticated models, but data doesn't make decisions. And so we're still working with a lot of organizations to take that data, figure out what it means, and then embed it into the organization to make decisions. Because if we could all predict exactly what the world is going to look like in 2030, companies could prepare for it. But what they're starting to do is they have some shapes for it, and they have to embed it into their ongoing processes to continue to monitor, to continue to be flexible, to think about their supply chains and their risk and their social impact. And the only other point I would make is that when we talk about climate risk, we often talk about it from the point of view of a company that can be a winner and loser. That mitigation was always kind of a team sport. All of our emissions, um, you know, ultimately go into the same atmosphere. But when we talk about risk, we've been framing it as how can this this individual firm outcompete that one? And that's really important for for driving engagement and helping them move forward. But it misses some of the second aspect of resilience, which is community resilience. And that's something we're seeing a lot in this pandemic. You know, as as vulnerable populations are being harmed disproportionately, as awareness of social and racial inequality is rising, what else else is there that firms can do to play that role that, you know, this is one of Gary's responsibilities is how do we look out for everyone and how do we make sure that climate risk isn't just, you know, that we prepare to play the role that we need to in the broader society. That's the other thing we're partnering with, with firms on is how to think about that, how to engage broadly with communities and how to create truly resilient strategies both now and in the future, whether it's ESG bonds, whether it's um, social listening and whether it's being part of the community. So lots of important stuff here, things you should think about, set your targets, push forward, whether it's supply chain, finance, creativity on mitigation and on adaptation, get your data, get it into your organization, do your TCFD, and think beyond your four walls about the communities and what, you, what role you're gonna to need to play going forward there. Well, thank you, Britt. 
Well, Gary, that's a, that's a perfect way to get to you. And, and by the way, good morning. Um, good morning. We are in L.A. County. And um, that is, if I can look it up here, it's, it's I think you 10 million people uh, or perhaps right. more now. And I think you're also the largest non-state level government entity in the, in the United States. Uh, and that your population is greater than... 41 individual U.S. <laughs> yeah, um, it's, a, it's a big county. You have a, yes. So, and, and you are dealing with the pandemic. You're dealing with wildfires or well, perhaps an economy that have many of your industries on hold. How, how do you go about embedding risk resiliency into your net zero strategy and and how do you go about you know ensuring that you actually get taxed to i assume money to to do all this right yeah no thank you so much and and yes it is morning here so good morning everybody or afternoon as the case may be um you're right the la county is a big county uh we would be a member of g20 if we were a nation so we're we're the largest manufacturing center in uh, in the United States, and one in 33 Americans lives here in Los Angeles County. Uh, so we are definitely uh, view ourselves uh, more state-like, perhaps than, than than many local governments. But the you know the key thing for any government agency, and I'm glad Britt raised this, is that you know it really is about taking care of the people who who live in your communities. Uh, this is the role of government essentially is to, to, to serve the people. And that's the role that we've taken on in the county. Uh, you know, we last year went through a, a, an extensive planning process, developed our sustainability plan. The Board of Supervisors adopted it unanimously. Um, but we did it in a, in a way that really engaged and brought people in. We didn't write a word of the plan until we'd held over 200 meetings and had more than 600 people come to events and workshops and sit down. And we hired five environmental justice organizations to help us get to populations that aren't typically outreached to and engaged in these topics. Um, and doing that really grounded our sustainability work in this notion of equity. And again, we are, we're also the public health agency for the, for the county. So we really brought a strong public health lens, which I think is the right lens as you're thinking about climate risk and resiliency. The risk is really to people. And we know that the risks of climate change are disproportionate to people of color and to low income individuals. And so we needed to make sure that we were engaging these communities in an authentic way and listening. And so we held listening sessions and we went out and asked, what would you want for your community? Um, and the, the fact is, that the state of California defines a disadvantaged community, if you will, um, through its what's called the California Environmental Screen. And it, it marries social demographic factors with uh, environmental exposure factors and identifies census tracts throughout the state of California that are deemed disadvantaged. And this, this is used actually to help spend some of the proceeds from the California cap and trade. There's a, there's, specific prioritization given to disadvantaged communities from the proceeds of the cap and trade program. Half of all of the census tracts that are deemed the most disadvantaged are in Los Angeles County. We're a quarter of the state's population, but half of the census tracts are in our county. And so we knew that environmental justice had to be the foundation of our sustainability plan. When you think about environment, equity, and economy, we really focused it and centered it on, on equity. And that is because we understand and we acknowledge that there's not only a legacy of racist policy that has created these disproportionate impacts, but in some cases, they are continuing to this day and we need to, we need to actively fight to overcome them. Uh, you know, our county uh, is also a large producer of fossil fuels. Before the movie industry ever got here, uh, we were an oil town and we're still an oil town and the largest urban oil field in the United States is in Los Angeles County, chock a block right next to, of course, a community of color. Uh, 
Uh, and so we're talking about climate or, or carbon neutrality and, and emissions reductions. We're doing things like committing to electrifying all of our bus fleet within the next 10 years. And we have three electric bus manufacturers in LA County that are helping us get there. But we're also attacking the supply side and, and starting to move policy and regulations to start to reduce the production of fossil fuels in our communities because of the disproportionate toxic impact they have on, on, uh, on communities of color. So the, the, as I said, the, the board adopted our sustainability plan last year. It does set uh, carbon neutrality goals. It lays a path for how to get there very much uh, along the lines that Britt uh, talked about, um, understanding where the low hanging fruit are or looking at electrification of, of transportation systems, not just buses, but writ large. We're looking at building decarbonization, starting to move policy and, and programs there. But the other thing the plan did is it directed that we would prepare a comprehensive climate vulnerability assessment for the county. And, not for, and there's 88 cities in the county. It's not just one government. There's the city of LA and there's 87 other cities. But this will be comprehensive for the entire county. And it'll look at both the physical infrastructure, the impacts of heat and we're about to experience another heat wave. We had another um, uh, uh, energy uh, curtailment last night or yesterday, um, but extreme heat, wildfire, of course, uh, drought, uh, precipitation, and we know that we're going to have droughts, but well, those droughts are going to be um, punctuated by periods of intense precipitation that can lead to inland flooding and that inland flooding also will be likely in communities of color that are low-lying uh, parts of the of the county. Uh, so we'll look at all of the climate uh, changes but also how they'll attack, attack, uh, affect our physical infrastructure and that's important to us one just from an operations and system standpoint but it's also important to us as a government because we collect revenue based on property values. And as property values erode because of changing climate, our own, our own revenues will be impacted. But we're also, and importantly, looking at social vulnerability, understanding who's vulnerable, why they're vulnerable, how they're vulnerable. And, and of course, we're looking at uh, outdoor workers. We're looking at socially or linguistically isolated communities. We're looking at now understanding through COVID essential workers and the potential impacts of climate change on essential workers. Uh, and of course, on low income communities, communities of color, the elderly population. Uh, and so that will help us start to develop uh, very detailed and specific strategies to, to try to adapt. So we are clearly focused on the, on the mitigation side and reducing emissions, but we're very much focused on the adaptation and resilience side because we are already experiencing the impacts of climate change in Los Angeles County almost on a daily basis uh, these days. And we actually need to uh, change our systems, change our, our structures to, to address it. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it there, but I'm happy to answer questions uh, and really appreciate the opportunity to be here today and, and to be on such a esteemed panel. And, and maybe, thank you. maybe I can, in, you know, you're a sustainability officer. When, when the pandemic hit, we had a lot of uh, sustainability officers that was told, <laughs> you know, we are in a situation right now, it's cash. Um, you know, your, your good sustainability things, they, they, you know, can we wait a little bit? That, thank God, did not last for long. But in your situation, when the pandemic hit and you had all your sustainability efforts and net zero efforts in, in place, did that, did, did anybody say, oh, you know, we need to put those on hold? You know, it, it, uh, yes and no. There were a couple of things, unfortunately, we did put on hold. Uh, we had been in the process of creating a youth climate commission to really try to harness the, the energy of, of uh, young people in LA County. That got put on hold. Uh, we had been working on a single-use plastics ordinance, and I know there's going to be a uh, discussion of plastics later, but we were really looking at how can we reduce the, the use and disposal of single-use plastics in our county. That got put on hold, mostly because the industry that would be primarily affected was the restaurant industry, and they, they are already deeply affected by COVID. 
Um, but other things to have actually continued. So we have not uh, delayed our work around, and, and part of it, fortunately, uh, for instance, uh, we're putting out a bid for about a quarter billion dollars of privately financed renewable solar on, on county facilities, solar plus storage. That doesn't require us to have the revenue that, that we are losing, using a PPA model for that, uh, and that can hopefully continue. But the county's revenues are seriously affected. We've lost about a billion dollars in this year's budget. Um, and not only have our revenues been affected, but actually our program, my, my office, I've, I've been assigned to the Emergency Operations Center. I'm, I'm full-time working on food and feeding programs for affected populations. I've taken one of my staff with me. And so we're at half staff in the sustainability office because we're, we're in, in the emergency response. And I think that's just the nature when crises hit, uh, people have to step up and work. And, and there is, of course, a food and sustainability connection. So it made logical sense why we took that on. Um, but it, it is affecting the ability for us to deliver on some of our programs timely. Thank you. And, and well, and thank you for all you do. I, I think you it's a, it's a huge both responsibility and, and job. So thank you and all of the others out there that, that's helping on, on all of these very important things. I, I see I'm getting questions in, so sorry I'm looking down now to, to read the questions, but there's a question um, for you, Britt. Uh, what's the biggest trend that you're seeing from your clients over the past six months? Has the pandemic impacted or altered path? Kind of like the same, I was just asking. Mm -hmm. uh, wonderful questions about what we're seeing in terms of trends and clients. I think we're seeing a few trends. The, the first one is that we're not seeing sustainability slow down. We, there, was, there was a brief pause that you described whenever, when we were all wondering what was going to happen to society, perhaps, for a month or two. But the pressures around to continue pushing forward on sustainability initiatives remain very strong. And we're seeing that being driven by you know, big external megatrend factors. We're seeing the finance industry turn its pressure towards wanting to see companies be both sustainable and prepare for climate risk and be resilient. That now there, you talked a lot and Paula talked a lot about ESG funds, uh, BlackRock's announcement. We're continuing to see pressure to keep moving. And so companies are responding to that by continuing to move on their sustainability journeys, whether it's continuing to just get started for some or continuing to push towards leadership for others. So I think that's one of the major trends we're seeing. We are seeing companies be a little bit cash constrained. I think everybody, the pandemic is making companies, some, it's, it's hurting the revenues of some, it's making others nervous about the future. And so we're seeing more and more work around uh, creative finance, no upfront cost, PPPs. And we're working uh, at the forefront with a number of those companies about how to continue their sustainability journey uh, in creative, uh, creative finance forms and how to harness some of that ESG capital in order to continue to make progress while working within their ROIs and balance sheets. And I would say the third is we're seeing a really increased interest in climate risk. We're, um, that we're seeing more and more companies say, oh, this is serious. This is touching us um, in a way that, that perhaps it didn't before. And, and I think we're still, many of them are at immature points on that journey, as I described, but that they're starting to get interested. They're starting to feel that this is something they need to think about. And they're trying to figure out how to fit it into their organization to figure out what it means for them, which parts of the organization need to be part of it. Because as I said, the, the GHG accounting is a little bit more mature, but this touches different parts, such as enterprise risk management, it touches supply chain, uh, and it touches finance and investor relations. And so how to bring them together to think about climate risk in this new way. Super, thanks. There's a question here. And I actually, Paula, if I can bring you in first, and, and then Gary, bring you in. Um, it's saying looking outside, it's from Danielle, looking outside the US, there's increasing regulation stimuli in the EU pushing a net zero strategy. Uh, and then afterwards, Gary, I'll, well, the question will be, how much is the LA County looking to, to that work? But before we go to you, Paul, you said before that innovation, all right, is, is kind of like happening more perhaps on a European side. And, and I think, Britt, you were, you were saying, well, people are strapped for, for cash, but perhaps not really looking to the opportunities. So perhaps, Paula, if you can tell us a little bit about what, what is happening in, in Europe or perhaps other places, uh, that 
that uh, Gary could could say, hey, we should we should take this on. Well, I mean, you know, obviously the European the Paris Agreement. Uh, you know, without being in the Paris Agreement in the United States, all U.S. companies are at somewhat of a disadvantage in terms of prioritizing and and planning. And also, you know, that means that companies here are doing kind of what they can do. So that's, you know, innovation of product and circular economy and reducing emissions in every little candy bar. But we find out today from the IEA that net zero is absolutely out of reach if we don't really get get ahead in uh, carbon capture and, and storage, CCUS. Now, who's going to invest in that? And, 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 and should we maybe be creating a, a consortium of investors focused on that? You know, maybe we don't need so many first movers. We need more second and third movers to join the first movers. So if we take CCUS as an indispensable, who's going to be investing in that? You have to look to the EU for a regulatory framework that would encourage that because you have predictable tax incentives. You have predictable um, cost of capital. You know, CDP has begun working with private equity uh, firms uh, to try to help people like LA County bond issuers, bond, bond um, the bond markets, because the cost of capital, the cost of borrowing, whether it's a PPA model or not, is going to be favorable to companies and enterprises that have demonstrated their climate awareness. So throughout the economy, there is a need to, to recognize um, the importance of a, of a predictable framework and some bottom line organizational principles so that if you're the CEO, let alone the board, you can say, hey, in the next five to 10 years, we can expect these rewards if we do X. And if the companies don't see the rewards and the society doesn't see the big payoffs, net zero is just another term. I mean, Britt listed all the terminology that we have. I hope that answers. So Gary, are you, are you, is this something that's helpful for you? And are you hearing from some companies, we would like to have some very clear guidelines so we know where to be and perhaps from others saying, no, rather have it as it is now. Yeah, well, it's always a, it's always a mixed bag, um, but you know the the board the, the county board of supervisors has committed to the Paris Agreement. Of course, we're in California, and California is also committed to the Paris Agreement and is operating a, a cap and trade system. And before I came to the county uh, government, I, I ran a nonprofit, the Climate Action Reserve, that worked very closely with the state government and with state governments from around. Uh, or, or sub-regional governments, as they're called in the international context, um, to, to really try to bring those connections of what are the best practices. We, you know, California is an innovator and a leader, but it doesn't do it by itself. It doesn't do it in a vacuum. And LA County is the same way. We, we have to understand what others are doing in, uh, in Europe and in Asia and in South America and Africa. Um, and, and take those best practices and bring them into to our, own, uh, our own systems, our own policies, our own programs. Um, so we, we are always learning. Uh, and of course, you know, the key sectors, transportation, building-based emissions are things that we have some control over. You may have seen California recently announced uh, that we're going to phase out uh, gasoline powered vehicles by 2035. Um, and so there are things that the state can do that the county can't, but there are things that the county can do that the state can't. And, and this is really where we get to things like land use policy. And this is, you know, LA is the poster child for sprawl and dependent car dependency. And that, you know, to use a phrase, uh, DNA is not destiny, and we have to change how we think about how our communities are designed and built. And that is something we have power over. We are, a, we are the local land use authority, and we need to think more like a European 
city and densify and it doesn't mean skyscraper densify it means human scale densification where we can actually rely on what's you know the notion of a 20 minute city where you can walk or bicycle to just about everything you need and we need to we need to overlay that on uh, a structure that was designed for cars and that's difficult and people are going to resist um, but i think that's part of how we get to to carbon neutrality quite honestly it isn't always a technology fix sometimes it's a it's a it's a policy fix so perhaps Brett, this, this is for you um when we look at a lot of companies that are now saying yes okay we will have our net zero strategy we'll do all of this but we are perhaps based in in california or some of the other states where we had the wildfires and they go like, well, you know, we're doing all this, but it's destroyed by a wildfire. We, we did or we did not have any, any impact on. Uh, and Gary, it's also to you kind of like, do you see that companies will start saying, hmm, maybe should we find another place to, to have our, our you know, factories, our, our buildings, et cetera? Or, or is this um, not happening yet? Uh, Britt, I don't know if you want to start on, do you hear anything like that from your, from your clients? Hmm, that's a great, I mean, it's a great question. And your question is, are we starting to see asset relocation based on climate risk? And I think we are starting to see serious consideration about that. And when we talked, when I talked about getting those, you know, improved climate model data and say, starting to learn where is it going to hail more? What kind of roof do I need? Um, I don't think we have yet seen state level movement because there are a lot of other factors that determine where you put the things you put them. Uh, a lot of those, you know, from the economic development world around clustering, around connectivity, around power, around supply chains. And, you know, we are still currently in a, an approach of hardening and adaptation as opposed to retreat. It's possible that that day will come, but I don't, we haven't really seen it yet from a, from a weather impacts perspective. I think what the main response we're seeing when we see um, companies be harmed by these things is to push harder and be louder and say, we need to manage our mitigation and our adaptation at a, both at, a, at our own level and at a national and international framework level. We're saying this is serious and you're leaving us in this very difficult and uncertain position. And so that, I think that, that's a response we're seeing more, but we're definitely seeing companies start to think and prepare and, and what's gonna happen to their supply chains. Where is rice gonna come from? Uh, how are we gonna get those hard drives? Do we need them to be made in multiple places because of these kind of impacts? We're starting to see diversification, supply chain shortening, things like that a little bit uh, as we look at these long-term impacts and plans. And, and Gary, I don't know if, 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 you're, if there's something you are, but there's a question that I might want to put to you and then perhaps you can take them together. Um, a global pandemic has been high on World Economic Forum's risk chart for years, but companies were caught unprepared. Um, then concerned will just repeat this with climate change. And I could perhaps add myself biodiversity crisis, etc. What are you doing or can you do anything to actually prepare those companies, those people, those that, that it's in, that's in, in your county? Yeah, I think that, well, let me take the, the previous question first and then I'll, I'll, I'll touch on that one. You know, we're not seeing companies leave either at this point. And, uh, you know, there's always, uh, there's always been in California this, this notion that uh, the, the California dream is is dead or dying and it's time, you know, time to pack up, but people don't pack up. People are staying because it's a great place to be. And it, it is a place of innovation and it is a place of kind of forward thinking, right? Um, and so people want to be here. Companies want to be here. Now, do they want to be in the, in the urban wildland interface where they're at risk of wildfire? Probably not. And that's a, that's a serious consideration is where do you put your facilities? Um, you know, when, when you hear that California is on fire, I mean, that's not literal, of course. And there's plenty parts of the, of the state that are, that are not subject to wildfire, but they are subject to other climate impacts, whether that's heat or flooding or sea level rise or whatever the case may be. Um, so those are considerations, but I don't, I haven't heard and haven't seen companies saying, oh, it's getting too dangerous here, uh, we're going to move. Um, 
in terms of preparing our our communities, both the in people com, uh, communities and business communities, that's why we're going through this process to do a climate vulnerability assessment. And we've been very actively engaging. I was just speaking with uh, the Los Angeles Federation of Businesses yesterday about the climate vulnerability assessment to make sure that we're bringing business voices in. And, and they've, been, they've been fantastic about thinking about resilience. We went through a whole process last year with them pre-pandemic um, of actually workshops for businesses on preparing for disaster, preparing for the changes that climate change are gonna, uh, that is gonna bring. Um, so they've been very forward thinking as a business organization, as a, as a coalition of businesses on, we know climate change is real. We know that the county and the state are serious about addressing it from a mitigation standpoint, but we also have to prepare our businesses to adapt. And they brought us in, and, and now we're likewise bringing them in into our vulnerability assessment to understand where they're vulnerable and how do we start to plan programs and policies to, to, to reduce that vulnerability. So if you're, and I'm looking at the clock, so if you're your number one action point for those listening now, what would that be? Be prepared <laughs> or... I, yeah, I think it's the Boy Scout model is a motto is a good one. Be prepared, but you know I think it's it's also just be aware, right? And and know where the impacts are likely to be, uh, and take care of your neighbor. You know the government can't solve everything. The government isn't going to be there it, always. Uh, when there's a major crisis, as we've seen, you, we have to rely on each other and community. And that's part of social vulnerability. We're looking at how do we start to build community level resistance and checking on your neighbor to make sure they're okay and bringing them food when, when they can't go out because they shouldn't be going out due to social isolation. So I think we really need to, and we've seen great, great examples of people stepping up and just taking care of neighbors. And I think ultimately that's how we're gonna get through this. That is a human, take care, good care of each other. Britt, your number one thing people should do Monday morning or perhaps today. Mm -hmm. The number one thing people should do Monday morning is Get going on your sustainability journey for your company. Wherever you are, if you're just at the start, get started. If you're way at the far end and you're a global leader, keep pushing, Put band together where it makes sense to band together. Uh, go it alone where you think your organization needs to go it alone and uh, look to the leaders and look to leading practices because a lot of this has already been figured out. There we go. Paula? Well, I like your artwork behind you, Hella. You know, it gives me inspiration. But I think the first thing is to have hope. Um, you know, it's a very trying times. And I like what Gary said about thinking of each other. <clears throat> to what Britt just said, get started. And to that, I would add, um, obviously, have hope. And how to have hope is to make all this doable. You know, get started in doable bites. There's a ton, Gat, Britt just said, there's so much known, there's so much best practice, there's so much with, that has already been done, already said. You know, it's great to plan for 20, 25 years. It's wonderful to have an intergenerational goal, but that's not how people live. And that's not how CEOs decide, that's not how money flows. We need doable bites. So if I think people need to wake up and think, what can I do in the next three years? What can I do in the next one year? What can I deliver in the next six months? Bring it all down to an arc of responsibility that you can deliver. And then little by little, if you deliver for a year, you can deliver for two years and three, and then the 10 year thing becomes very doable. And that's why I think, you know, CDP disclosure brings such value, this annual truth test. So hopeful, doable, and let's do it. Thanks a lot. Well, thank you. And, and may I ask, or add perhaps to this, get your board. Get the board of directors on board. We need the tone at the top. We need to ensure that board of directors understand this and therefore also are able to have the oversight that's that's needed. Um, and and that's clearly clearly what I'm doing every single day. So so, but I think it is it is very important. With those words, Liam, I think we are on on time. Um, so if yes, you want to, yes, um, sorry, thank sorry. you, panel. 
Thank you, Hella. Thank you. Thank you for chairing that discussion. Thank you, Paula, Gary and Britt. Um, what a great discussion and what positive sentiments to leave it on. Action, hope, um, get the board involved, bite-sized chunks. Um, uh, yeah, there's a number of things to take from that. And thank you. Thank you from that. And um, those that listened in, if you joined just at the end, we recorded the session. It's going to be uploaded onto the On Demand Hub, ready for you guys to access shortly. But again, thank you to, to, all, to all of you for a great discussion. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. You. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye. Take care, guys. Okay, so yes, we've got the, the discussions underway. Uh, we're, we're all moving now and we're going over to the next discussion. It's a 15-minute presentation titled Delivering Performance, Resiliency and Sustainability in the Built Environment. Providing the presentation is Kathy Loftus, Vice President of Business Development at E2S. Here's the presentation. <laughs> 